This uh, series is going to be a series of lessons for youth workers. I teach youth ministry at Ozark Christian College, and uh, last summer, no, two summers ago, I had one of my students come to me and, and tell me that he had an opportunity to go and be a youth minister for the summer at a particular church. And he asked me, um, uh, what is the most important thing I need to try to do this summer? And he was so excited to tell me about some of his plans, some of his ideas and different things. And I said, well, you know, honestly, the most important thing you need to do is to prepare for the church for when you're not there after the summer's over. You need to invest in some adult volunteers. Because in all honesty, if you're just there for three months, you're just a hired gun. You're just there to run a program for the summer, keep things going, keep everybody busy, have some good things going on, some lessons, pool party camps, all that kind of stuff. But you know what? You're going to be gone in three months. Someone's going to have to be there when you're done. Invest in those volunteers. I want volunteers to know how incredibly valuable they are to every youth ministry. Youth minister can't do it by, themse by themselves. I, I, was, I served as a youth minister for seven years at one church and, and 10 years at another, and in both places, the persons who came alongside me were there, some of them before me, some of them after me, and just, we just had a team that worked together to do this ministry we call youth ministry. You're incredibly valuable. And so uh, we're gonna break this down uh, right here, this lesson, in two parts. I'm gonna give you uh, some expectations that I would have for youth workers today, for the volunteer youth staff. In part one, I'm gonna give you one, two commitments. Your first commitment is that of your commitment to Jesus Christ. I think that, uh, that some of you might be thinking, wow, really? Really? Uh, you mean there's adults volunteering in churches to work with students who aren't Christ followers? And the answer is, well, yes and no. As strange as it may sound, some churches are so desperate for persons to come and work with their children's and youth ministries that, that they'll take just about anybody that's, that's breathing. Um, they just need some help. They may do a background check. They may even ask them some questions about working with teenagers, but sometimes they don't ask that really, really important question. Tell me about your relationship with God. When did you accept Jesus as your Savior? Um, tell me about that decision. How many of you went through any kind of a personal interview with uh, someone at the church that asked you those kind of questions? Were you asked to tell about how you became a Christian? Because more than anything else, your work is about Jesus. He ought to be at the center of your lessons and your talks and your, your programming and your relationships with students. Confess that He is your Savior and Lord and be willing to confess that every day. You know what? We're not looking for perfect people. We have never been looking for perfect people. We're looking for people who may be, uh, may be broken, but, but they are now walking with Jesus. They're doing their best that they can to do that. Uh, they recognize their need for Him. Students need to see that Jesus is real in your life. They need to see that Christianity is more than something you just do on Sundays. I mean, honestly, are you in love with Jesus and do you desire to know him? Do you desire to know him today more than you did one year ago? Steve Farrar is an author and he asks this question. Are you, do you, I'm sorry, do you want to grow up in Jesus or grow old in Jesus? That's a good question. Jacob Aranza wrote this. Neither spiritual depth nor spiritual shallowness will remain hidden for very long. And I would add, especially uh, uh, that, that people can see through this, especially teenagers. They've got this built-in phony detector. They're highly sensitive about anyone who's fake or phony with their life. And, th and they hate that. So let me give you a few tips on keeping your commitment to Jesus strong. Number one, you got to be in the Word. Make a promise not to go 24 hours without reading some of Scripture. Um, read it, memorize it, call on it throughout the day. I'd be willing to say that, that if you read the Bible for a half hour a day, you're going to start noticing a difference in yourself after a couple of weeks. And I would say that if you keep doing that after a month or two, uh, or, or maybe even sooner, others around you are going to notice a difference. Take in the Word just a little each morning. Use a, use a, a Bible app or a read through the Bible in a year plan, some kind of Bible reading plan. But I would also tell you on reading the Bible, do what you can, not what you cannot. If you can't, if you can't spend an hour reading every day, don't, don't let that... Um, make you feel terrible about yourself. Just do what you can, not what you can't. Read a few verses, five, six verses. Spend some time thinking about that, meditating on that. Second thing I tell you is to pray. Every godly person I know is a person of prayer. You cannot get close to God without praying. Um, once you begin to abandon prayer, you begin to abandon your walk with God. 
It's that simple. Uh, I've got a, a friend who used to be a youth pastor for a long time in New York. His name is Mike. And uh, Mike told me one time, he said, you know, there's a lot of things I can't do very well. I, I, I can't sing. I'm not the greatest speaker around. But one thing I can do is pray. And so he was a runner at the time. And he just said, you know, in the town I live in, I've been there so long as, as I run and go past houses, I pray for the people in those houses because I know so many of them. Just spend time praying. Spend time in prayer and seek others who will do the same for you uh, and your family. Number three, I tell you to seek positive uh, accountability, Barnabas-type relationships. Allow other people to speak wisdom into your life. If you don't allow other people to speak into your life, then you'll probably never hear God speak into your life either because God speaks through his people. Uh, I've got a buddy named Dan, and uh, we get together about once every two weeks, I guess, and and uh, it might be for lunch or it might be for racquetball or whatever, but we have these questions that we can ask each other anytime we want. They're our accountability questions. What are you reading? What are you praying about? When's the last time you asked your wife on a date? <laughs> these are our accountability questions. And that's good to have that person. Allow people to confront you if they need to. Why is it that we'd rather allow a friend to make poor moral choices than to confront them about those things? Why is it that that we would, you know, take this a step further, we'd allow a friend to walk away from their faith rather than confront them about that. It's just, it just doesn't make sense. We need each other in order to stay on track. Chances are extremely high that you will fail if you choose to walk the road alone. Barnabas relationships are encouraging. Let's be honest, student ministry is a lot of fun, but it can be draining. <laughs> Honestly, it, it can suck the life out of you, can it? <laughs> it really can. We need relationships with people who pick us up, people who encourage us, people who are life-giving, not life-sapping. And so seek to spend time with people that, uh, that you enjoy working with and laugh with. Number four, I tell you just to love the church. As, in, as imperfect as the church is, she's the bride of Christ. And so love the church. Don't be critical of the church. Uh, besides your attendance, You'll support the church, and you'll support those who, who work there. If you want your students to love Jesus and love the church, well, then you've got to do that. It's that simple. You love the church in your words, your actions, even in your church attendance. And number five, be teachable. And on this be teachable part, I would tell you a couple things you can do. Is, is one, read Christian authors. There's so many good ones. Find some that just speak to you. Mark Twain once said, those who don't read are little better off than those who cannot. I, I read one time that the average adult reads Zero books cover to cover once they get past college. That's amazing. By not reading, we actually minimize our impact because we don't choose to draw on the wisdom of others or the experience of others. John Wesley told a group of young ministers one time, read or get out of ministry. There's just so much good you can gain from it. So many good books, so many good authors, Tim Keller, Francis Chan, Dallas Willard. Second thing I'd tell you is to build life-stretching experiences into your calendar. It is so easy to become complacent in your walk with God. It's, it's kind of the same way that you can become complacent in your work or complacent in your marriage. It happens too easily. You know, we build life-stretching experiences into the calendar for our students and our student ministries. Why don't we build them into our own life? Like taking a personal one-day or two-day retreat. You know, I know those are hard to find. Someone suggested this to me about two years ago, and I've been doing it, and it's just really, really helpful. They said, take a one-hour retreat. Just at lunchtime, grab your lunch, hop in your car, hop in your truck, and uh, I would sometimes I'd, I'd drive through, uh, I'd go through a drive through window at a restaurant, grab my food, and then I'd just go sit at a park someplace and sit and talk with God or try to listen to God. And uh, their advice was, when you do this, take nothing, not even an agenda. Just ask God to speak to you. Take a one-hour retreat. You can also go on a mission trip, and not just as an adult helper, but to go to ask God to open up your life and your heart and, and for you to experience what He wants you to experience in your life, to just work you over. I just have to pray, Lord, help me to never stop learning and growing. Help me to th never think I've got it all figured out. You know, the older I get, the more I realize how much I don't know. Keep growing, keep learning. The second commitment I would tell you is, is a commitment to family. Honor your family. Give it priority. Uh, uh, give your marriage and family priority. In doing this, we honor God. 
I was talking to a youth minister in Florida named Adam, and he just had this to say when I asked him about advice to youth workers. He said, I'm sorry for asking too much of your time. Forgive me for the times that I delegate, uh, the things that I delegate take too much time away from your spouse or children. Please let me know if I'm asking too much. The last thing I want our ministry to do is to have a negative impact on your marriage or your family. Steve has been a youth minister in Oklahoma for years and years, and his advice was this. Make sure your kids, your students, and your co-laborers know that you love your spouse. But first, make sure that you love your spouse. I met a youth pastor in Indiana a few years ago that was having problems in his marriage, and after hearing him talk for a while, I came to realize, well, the problem is you. You see, he had a difficult time with his wife, uh, having to work on Saturdays. They needed the second income, and so she was working on Saturdays. What, but what that meant was he had to stay home with his children, <laughs> his offspring, and he'd rather be out hunting or fishing. And I remember hearing him talk, and I thought, good grief, man, love your spouse and kids more than a fish. Well, that might be oversimplifying it. But I would tell you this. If your own children were asked, which you love more, spending your day off with them or spending your day off doing your favorite hobby or sport, what would they say? Drew has been a, a longtime youth pastor. Um, he just challenges you to, to, when you're having difficulties in marriage, to talk to someone, um, to help, uh, they, that there are people there who want to help you, and so talk to them. There's so many broken families. More teens come home to an empty house today in the United States than ever before in our country's history. It's, it's so healthy when a kid can come home and one of his parents are there. Question for you. When is it okay for both parents to go back to work and have the kids come home to an empty house? When is that okay? Well, some people say, well, once they get to grade school and, and you know, they can make it through school and, okay, I can go, to, go get a job and, and be working. And some people say, well, you know, maybe when they get to junior high, maybe when they get to high school. Well, this is a trick question. When is it best? The answer is Never. When is it best for them to come home to an empty house? Never. It's always good when, when your son or daughter can come home after school and at least one parent is there, someone to talk to, someone to spend time with. The family unit is under attack, and we've got to do what we can to bridge the parent-teen relationship. Part of your job as a youth worker is to be an ally, to be an advocate of parents. It's in our best interest to come alongside them. The truth is this. Parents will always have a bigger influence on students than the best youth worker ever will. It's just fact. Even the parents who are doing the right things need help. If parents are wise, they'll ask for help and will want to give it as youth workers there in the church. Finally, I'd tell you one more thing about family, and that is to always consider the impact that you have, your ministry has on families. First of all, in time, encourage students to spend time with their families, to eat supper with their parents, to go on family outings. If a kid misses an event because they're doing something with their family, well, you know what? Pat them on the back and tell them that's great rather than making them feel bad for not coming. And, and the other thing I would tell you to, to realize your impact uh, on families is with your ministry is, is in money. As a youth ministry team, make sure that you offer as much as possible that doesn't cost them money to actually have to attend Think about that in your retreats and your camps and, and your activities. Can I go to a camp that is two hours away instead of a camp that is 12 hours away? One costs $300, one costs $150. Which one's going to help the family more? Think about that. Oh, on a mission trip, can I do a mission trip that's, that's in an inner city two hours away? Or do I have to go to one in Asia that's going to cost us, oh, I don't know, $1,500, $1,800 just for the airfare? Think about it. Consider family first. There's two commitments for you. Your commitment to Christ, your commitment to family.